Okay, uh, hello to everyone. It's uh, nice to see you all. Today, we are very happy that we have uh, Sean Harnell, who is going to tell us about entanglements in the quantum hole matrix model. So, Sean, take it away. Well, great. Uh, thanks, uh, Felipe, for, for the invitation. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be speaking uh, to you all. Uh, by all means, please please interrupt me. If I don't hear you right away, just you know, shout. Um, this is going to touch on a few points that I know uh, many of you have thought about from one way or another. And so uh, any questions are very, very, very welcome. So I'll, I'll talk about entanglement in um, the quantum hole matrix model that I'll introduce uh, shortly. So I am going to start with a few big picture things. I, I think these are, to this audience, especially are, are quite quite known, um, but so I'll just go through them quickly, but do, do stop me uh, if, if you want. So, you know, um, many great things happened last century um, in, in the sort of theoretical realm. A cool thing that happened near the end was the Strominger and Waffer results, which matched the black hole entropy with accounting problem in certain very highly supersymmetric cases. Um, and, you know, let's just remind us about a nice thing that this entails. It means that there's a certain area of geometry, a certain geometrical quantity, an area of a certain solution that is matched by uh, accounting, by an entropy, which means um, a logarithm of some number of states. And the number of states that matched is, is in essence, I mean, of course, it's, it's a very highly symmetric, supersymmetric version of this, but in essence, you imagine a string, the string is carrying some momentum P in this in, in along chirally, along some direction. And then you ask, how many ways can you distribute this momentum P among different quanta. There could be one quantum with a lot of momentum or lots of quanta with different momenta. And the number of ways you can carry the momentum uh, is, is, a, is the number of partitions of that momentum. And there's a famous formula by Hardy Ramanujan that gives you the asymptotic behavior of this partition. This, the, the P is some charge of the black hole. And, and so you plug that into the formula and it gives you this area. Okay. So this is just a, an, a, the, the canonical example of a microscopic counting that tells you something about a geometry, a geometric quantity. Okay, we'll come, let's just keep that in mind for half an hour or so, and we'll come back to it later. Um, now, as, as you all know very well, in the last decade or so, um, thanks largely to this Ruta Kanagi formula, it's clear that entropy can as be associated to more, to more general surfaces, not, not just horizons. And so that's this, this salt bubble that's supposed to represent a, a minimal surface. And the idea that the, the entanglement entropy across minimal surfaces in, in theories of gravity have the sort of the contribution to, you, I'll, I'll talk more about entanglement in a, in a second, have the sort of contribution that you might expect from the fields that live in the space time that are entangled across the, across the cut. But then there's this sort of universal uh, within Einstein gravity uh, term. And it's natural to wonder what what you know what is the bulk microscopic origin of this entanglement. You know, from the boundary theory, it's just it's just an entanglement in the boundary theory. But uh, you can we can also think of it as a bulk quantity. And um, you know, there, there are many reasons that I won't go into that suggest that these two contributions really come hand in hand, right? The UV divergences. Of the, of the matter contribution, we normalize this Newton constant. So there's not really a clean separation between these, these two things. And so that, that just suggests this is telling you about some kind of microscopic bulk entanglement. So obviously, I think we would like to know uh, what that is. And because it's so universal, it would seem to be telling us something. So suppose we could answer the question. What we would learn is presumably something universal about the kinds of quantum states that can underlie a semi-classical gravitating geometry. That is, we might hope to learn something about how space-time is actually made, right? So I mean, there's a lot of evidence and, you know, Mark and others were early, early people to think about that, the idea of entanglement stitching together space-time and so on. But we'd like to know how does that actually happen, you know, microscopically in the bulk. Uh, we're not gonna answer this question today, but that's the, the, the big picture. So let me remind you of a few things about entanglement that, that will might come up uh, during this, this talk. Uh, again, probably not necessary for this audience, but let me remind you anyway. Um, so why is entanglement useful? So if you've got a complicated, you know, entanglement starts off with very simple things with bell pairs and, and so on. Uh, but if you have a very complicated wave function with lots of degrees of freedom, uh, then one would like 
obviously that wave function is a very, very complicated function. And we would like to be able to associate some simple numbers to that function uh, that tell us something essential about the wave function without having to write down the whole thing. And entanglement turns out to be a very useful entanglement entropy, useful uh, thing there. So for example, let's imagine some kind of lattice model with its spins. Um, if the Hamiltonian is local, meaning things only roughly talk to, to nearby things, and then uh, you know, with some assumptions and so on, you can prove that the 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 most of the entanglement in the ground state of such a system is is short range, right? So let's say if two spins have an s dot s interaction, then they want to form triplets or or singlets depending on the the sign of the term, and that those are both entangled entangled pairs of spins, and the statement is in the ground state of such as the many body ground state of such a system most of the entanglement is in these local spins. And the spin over here is not very entangled with the spin over there. Okay, and so the fact that most of the entanglement is short range, it means that if you calculate the entanglement of everything inside the square with everything outside, you get the entanglement entropy that goes like the, well, the perimeter, but it's called an area law of that square. That's a very, very useful thing because if you wish to find such a ground state, it means you don't have to parameterize the whole two to the n dimensional Hilbert space but rather there's some n to the chi dimensional subsets uh, where n is the number of spins uh, that, that, that obey these area, have this area law entanglement. A generic state in the Hilbert space is far too entangled to be a ground state. Uh, and so, um, so this entanglement is a very useful characterization of the ground states. Okay. And second useful thing is that um, in, you know, let's say you have some spins that there's, a, there's no gauge symmetry anywhere. But if the spins decide not to order at very low um, low temperatures, you'll end up with some kind of spin liquid. And that's often associated with an emergent gauge field. But how do you know, if you're just a microscopic physicist, how do you know if there's an emergent gauge field in your low energy dynamics? And the top and uh, actually entanglement is one way you can tell that. And the, the, the essential point is that if you have, um, um, emergent, uh, an emerging, the essence of an emergent gauge field is that there's an emergent Gauss law. There's some constraint, there's some sort of fluxes going through the system that tell you about how much charge is in a region. And so what that means is that when you count an area law, like in this first picture, you sort of overcount a little bit because you're not accounting for these, these, these global non-local correlations, constraints enclosed by Gauss's law. The way you can pick out that is to consider a non-simply connected region like this one, and then consider, so this was done by Kitab, Preskill, and uh, Levin and Wen. You consider like this, this, this sequence of, of regions that have the same area, but different topologies, and so a different sensitivity to Gauss, to Gauss law type constraints. And you sort of subtract off the area law term. And when you do that, there's a finite universal term left that there's called the topological entanglement. And that tells you that can be proven again with in, you know gap systems and so on can be proven to connect to the existence of topological excitations and typically associated chern simons type uh, gauge fields okay so so that's just a both of these are going to kind of ideas are going to show up later right but these are two things that entanglement is is good for if you're a many body physicist all right so suppose we want to understand um Vitek and Aggie, or you know, entanglement in gravity from a microscopic point of view, uh, we need to get to grips with the microscopic models that we know give rise to semi-classical gravity. And the, the, the best of those are involve large end matrices in, in various ways. Now, because we're thinking about entanglement, we want to think about quantum states. The quantum state of a field theory is a rather complicated beast. And so it seems like the simplest thing to start with are matrix quantum mechanics, right? So that's a large N. Um, uh, it's just a normal undergraduate quantum mechanics, except that instead of one oscillator, you have whole big matrices worth of oscillators, okay? And we'd like to understand how to start thinking about the entanglement in such wave functions, and the wave functions of such a theory. Um, so I'm not gonna, some people have, you know, jumped in and trying to think about BFSS, which has a lot of matrices, a lot of fermions. So the approach I want to take is we're going to, I just want to very slowly get to grips with how do we think about matrix wave functions and matrices. And so we're going to start with low dimensional models with a few number of matrices. Uh, 
that do not give rise to gravity, but they do give rise to an emergent space. So they have some of the things that we might be looking for. Now, I'm mostly gonna talk about a model with two matrices, but before we get there, I'll spend one slide on the absolute simplest model, which is if you have a single large N matrix. And so let me just remind you how, how that works. And it's this model is integrable, it's been solved over and over again uh, since the 90s, and it's used, but let's think about it briefly from an entanglement point of view. So this is gonna be rather brief. If you've never thought about this model before, this slide may not help you very much, but if you have at least had some intersection with this mod these models, hopefully it's useful. So a single matrix, matrix quantum mechanics, has a Lagrangian that looks like that. So there's M is an N by N, let's say Hermitian matrix, classical matrix, right? It, it has a kinetic term, This is, and it has some V of M of potential, and the whole Lagrangian has a trace structure. So this thing has an SUN gauge symmetry. You can, I mean, yeah, let's take it to be gauged. Now, when you only have a single matrix and you're interested in the singlet sector, so the, the gauge singlet sector, you can diagonalize your matrix, right? And that's why one matrix is much easier than any number bigger than one. So you can, you can use your gauge symmetry to diagonalize the matrix, and then you're gonna get an effective Hamiltonian for the eigenvalues. And once you're in the eigenvalues, you're kind of back to many body particle, you know, single part, particle particles, a theory of particles rather than matrices, and you can use usual techniques on it, right? So it's not really, the matrices don't do very much for you here, except determine the kind of uh, theory you get for the eigenvalue. So what is that theory? So when you diagonalize the, uh, the matrices, there's a measure term in the path integral. This is famous van der Mond term that, that is anti-symmetric and you can incorporate that into the wave function. And when the dust settles, what you find out is that the eigenvalues of this matrix are non-interacting fermions, okay? This measure factor just anti-symmetrizes them, but there are no interactions between uh, the fermions. So the theory amounts to you have to take N non-interacting fermions and put them in your potential. So what do fermions in a potential do? They sit in the ground state, and then because of Pauli exclusion, they start occupying more and more excited states. And so they fill up a Fermi C. What uh, are the excitations of a Fermi C? Well, to do, what you do is you take a, the lowest energy excitation is you take a Fermi on that's just below the Fermi surface and you put it just above the Fermi surface. And so there's a density fluctuation. And what you can prove in this model is that the density fluctuations obey a wave equation that move, that can move along uh, that move around the Fermi surface, the, um, along the Fermi C, obeying a wave equation. And that, that's your emergent one-dimensional space. You started with zero plus one, right? There was no space here. The eigenvalues, the Fermi C builds the space and the local dynamics, the emergent local dynamics is just a wave equation moving around on, on this, on this one-dimensional space, okay? And this is just, yeah, you can just show all this very, very explicitly in this case. Um, so what about, now suppose you wanted to try to understand the, the, this emergent locality. I mean, I should say this is not, as the experts may know, it's not very local, this model, but it, you know, it, 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 it's somewhat local. How could you see that locality from the eigenvalues? And so what you can do is take the wave function for the eigenvalues, which are the fermions, and you can um, calculate the entanglements of the fermions in some interval. And this is what's now being called, I mean, I think it's an old concept, but it's now being called target space entanglement. It's a bit different, right? If you have the spins everywhere, some spins are in this room, some spins are in that room, and it's obvious you, how you factorize your Hilbert space and calculate the entanglement. If you've got a particle that can move around between the two rooms, it's less obvious what you might mean by the entanglement of the particles in this room and in that room, because a single particle can move. Nonetheless, you can define such a notion. If you define it and you calculate it, uh, you get this answer, you get an answer, which is one third log the size of this interval in sort of some stringy units. You get a finite answer, of course, if you do it in the matrix, in the, in the, the eigenvalues. And in fact, Shumit Daz really did this calculation 20 years ago. Uh, and, and we did it more recently using some more fancy modern stuff, but the answer is the same as Shumit got. And this is, of course, the entanglement that you expect to get for of a massless one dimensional, one plus one dimensional field, right? So the entanglement in, in this emergent bosonic field can be calculated from the entanglement in the eigenvalue wave function. 
Okay. Uh, so can, can I ask yes. a question here? Please do. So, um, so this entanglement is, is in the space of the eigenvalues of the matrix. But if you want to map this to the target space, the mapping is generically non-local, right? Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I don't want to go, basically the short answer is I don't know the answer to, that, to this question. But so, we, so there are these leg pole factors and these are things you're talking about. And this, so I, I, I think there's a step here still to be understood. But what I can say is that if you, good. So it depends what you want these density fluctuations to be. So if you just use the collective field, like the Daz, Sakita, Javiki, et cetera, collective field, then, then, it's, then it's a local map. So, the, 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 so that, that wave to the eigenvalues is, is a local thing. But going from the collective field to the tachyon uh, does involve some non-local transformation, which uh, it seems doesn't affect the entanglement, meaning that it, you get the right answer. <laughs> From the eigenvalues, but but uh, that that should should be understood better. Uh, definitely. So, yeah. Strictly speaking, I would expect this to be correct near the weakly coupled region. Is oh yes, right? yes. I'm sorry. No, that that's correct. Yes, yes, okay, yes. Okay. This is this is expanded in the weakly that, coupled. That, region. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But no, this is a wonderful. Uh, there is an op actually there are two open questions here. Um, um, one is that so again I think this is the right answer. With, insofar as you get to this collective field, because that is just the eigenvalues, really, and, and you already have a boson there. But when you map to the, the really the string the, the string the string fields, there is this non-local transformation that would be interesting to understand in terms of entanglement. And the second thing is this might also be a kind of gauge theoretic contribution to the entanglement, uh, which is not being calculated here. Um, but but uh, yeah, that, that's a very good question. Yeah, thank thank you. Um, Good. Okay. But let but what I mainly want to talk about today is going beyond. So one matrix, um, yeah, there, there definitely are subtleties, but the core, I feel the core, the core thing is is sort of is not too difficult. And it's sort of conventional because the eigenvalues of particles and we know how to calculate the entanglement of particles, in principle, at least. And it's also clear, you know, we know the very first thing we learn about ADS-CFT is you take these ND3 brains and you put them on top of each other, right? And that means that the strings connecting the, the brains are, are, are light, right? And, and, and you can't throw them away. And so if you roughly, the brains are like the eigenvalues and the off-diagonal modes of the brains are a bit like the strings connecting the eigenvalues, but roughly. And so it's sort of clear that if we really want to do meaty, higher dimensional grown-up holography, uh, it's going to be more than just eigenvalues. They're also going to be sort of off-diagonal modes. And the easiest way to see that is if you have two matrices, you can't diagonalize in them both mo most of the time. Okay, so so um, we, 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 we want to go beyond one matrix, right? Okay. And now then life gets, gets harder, right? Um, and, and it's not even clear how you should partition your system. And so the inspiration for our work came from this, this paper by, by TAFR group plus uh, Shumidas. And they made a very simple observation, actually. It's so simple that I kind of didn't even notice it uh, at first. And then, um, yeah, it was pointed out to me. So they say, well, okay, so what you should do is diagonalize one of the matrices. And the matrix you pick is gonna correspond to the different cut of space you want to make. And so even though there is no space in these matrix quantum mechanics, there's a sort of proto space in that, in that the matrices are roughly in one-to-one -one correspondence with the dimensions that are going to emerge, right? So, I, you know, I'm roughly, okay? Uh, so, so that we had this one matrix before that was one dimension, two matrices are going to give us two dimensions and, and, and so on. And so it's very natural so to, to, to so say you want to take a cut, let's say you've got X and Y, and you want to understand what's a cut in the X direction, then these guys say, diagonalize the X matrix and partition the eigenvalues of X. Let's say you want to make a circular cut, then you should build the matrix X squared plus Y squared and diagonalize that, and then partition the eigenvalues of that matrix. And up to issues of the fact that matrices don't commute, okay, which is a, a non-trivial issue, but, but roughly for any function, you can write down the corresponding function of any function that defines some hypersurface. You write down the corresponding function of matrices, and you find its eigenvalues, and you can partition the eigenvalues of that matrix. That that's that's the philosophy, at least. Um, but this doesn't really. I mean, I think this is a very natural first step. But let's say you've got two matrices, right? So you you x and y, 
you diagonalize one of them, you order the eigenvalues of, of that matrix, which you always have enough gauge symmetry to, to do. And so you've got some partition here. Now that's X, let's say, and then, but Y now, what is it? It's a block diagon. This partition of the eigenvalues of the diagonalized matrix becomes a block partition of the other, of the other matrix. And so then it's natural, pretty natural to think that maybe this block goes on one side of the cut and this block goes on the other side. But what are you going to do? You still have to think about what you're going to do with these off diagonal blocks. Uh, Daz et al essentially said, well, you can put them on one side or the other side. But I mean, I think there's, I think there's a deeper a deeper thing than that. But the, the, what, what we're definitely going to take from this paper is that it's very natural to diagonalize the matrix. That there's a it's a geometrically natural thing to diagonalize one of the matrices, okay? Because that sort of defines a co-dimension one surface, right? Is the is the idea, and then you and okay. Um, so the plan uh, today is I'm going to introduce a solvable model with two matrices, okay? That's going to be the the quantum hall matrix model, and I'm going to actually just in this model compute the entanglement of a geometric partition, and the way we're going to treat the off-diagonal modes, as I'll come to is gonna be inspired by the way people discuss entanglement in gauge theories. Because in gauge theories, you also have objects that belong on both sides of the cut, right? A Wilson line that goes through the entanglement cut. It, it, what side does that live on? Okay, it's very, 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 it's completely analogous to, to these off diagonal blocks of the matrix. And actually that point was made in this nice paper by Albion Lawrence and, and, and friends. Although, so what we're kind of adding to these previous Papers is we're actually going to calculate this thing in an actual in an actual states, and they're going to see there are a series of things you have to do to understand if you want to do that. And so we're going to get a two D area law and also some sort of topological like subleading uh, corrections. And this paper is my student Alex, and it's on the archive uh, there. So any any questions? This might be a good place for any preliminary questions. I mean, I'm going to give you details now in terms of the strategy. Yeah. Okay. So let me let me uh, briefly introduce the, the quantum hole matrix model. So um, this is how I think about it. I think the useful way to think about it. So what is the, the original quantum hole effect is you take electrons and you put them in a big magnetic field and they form an incompressible droplet. And that's a pretty non-trivial thing. You probably need Coulomb interactions, disorder, a lot of, you know, it's, it's not a trivial thing that they form these quantum hall phases, but, but they do. And an essential point of them is that these phases are incompressible. Okay, in fact, in Laughlin's original paper on the fractional quantum hall effects, the word incompressible is in the title. Okay, so, so it's, it's really a essential point of these models. And, and for, so they're sort of topological, they don't, they don't carry any excitations in the, in the bulk. And furthermore, the bulk is described by an emergent Chern Simons field. Okay. Now, suppose that you have such a description of an incompressible droplet with a Chern Simons field on it, the effective description, and you ask, well, I don't really want to go all the way to Coulomb interacting electrons with disorder. What is the minimal microscopic um, completion of this, of this effective, effective dynamics? sort of natural discrete where everything's finite version. And I think the answer to that question is, is this quantum hall matrix model. So this quantum hall matrix model is a, is a finite model that is as close as possible to keeping all the symmetries of an incompressible droplet with Chern Simons field on it. And, and the way it works is it uses, so what are the symmetries of an incompressible droplet? Incompressible means that if you push it here, it has to pop out somewhere else, right? And so the natural transformations are area preserving diffeomorphisms of, of, this, of the droplet and right? the things that move it around, but without the area changing because it's incompressible. As is quite well known from the eighties, in general, two dimensional area preserving diffeomorphisms are the limit as N goes to infinity of UN. And, and um, the, the context where you might've most been possibly seen this before, if, if it's not immediately familiar is in this fuzzy sphere. So let's take SU2, just, just to, in case, to motivate this, this statement I, meant, I made. So the, the statement is that the limit as n goes to infinity of un are these area-preserving area preserving diffios. Uh, and for example, consider SU2. And so that the Casimir of SU2 
Oh, and I just ran out of, I have to charge my pen again. Sorry, uh, it's not good. Actually, wait just one second. Just one second, sorry about this. I'll just say this in words. Um, so the Casimir of SU2 is x squared plus y squared plus z squared is r, is L, r squared, some constant, right? And so that looks like an equation for a sphere. So take the n-dimensional representation of SU2, right? So these are n by n matrices, and they will obey this out this 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 uh, algebra. And then you can consider functions of these matrices. So x matrix functions of three n by n matrices x, y, and z that obey x squared plus y squared z squared is equal to some constant. And the statement is that in the large n limit, those functions become the space of functions on a sphere because x, y, and z are commuting they, they, the matrices effectively start to commute as they get large. And as n goes to infinity, they become x, y, and z become commuting numbers that obey x squared plus y squared plus z squared so they live on a sphere. And the symmetries, the SUN transformations generate symmetries of this algebra, and they become the area preserving diffuse, a certain special subset of the functions on a sphere that happen to be the area preserving diffuse. Okay, then that would, okay. So, so th this is something from matrix theory in the in the 80s. And so what Suskin, what Lenny Suskin did in, in 2001 was write down a matrix quantum mechanics of n by n matrices that have this, whose symmetry, you can think of it as a discretization of the area preserving diffuse on the, of the droplets. Now, the way Lenny did it, it was actually a plane, okay? But then Polyquinacos, uh, shortly afterwards, wrote down the sort of IR-regulated version where you have a droplet, okay? And so it's pretty much the simplest two-matrix model you could imagine. So this, so it's a two-matrix model whose dynamics that contain a large N becomes basically Chern-Simons theory on a droplet. That, that's, that, that's, what, that's what it's designed to do, okay? Right, so... so um, so for our purposes, it's going to, going to provide an example of an emergent space, and it's going to be two-dimensional space, and it's going to be simple enough that we just know everything. Okay, so this is the Hamiltonian, uh, x squared plus y squared, they're two matrices, and x and y, n by n matrices, and x and y are canonically, co are component-wise canonically conjugate, okay? So y is more like a p, really, right? But this should be familiar from... In a large magnetic field, X and Y become conjugates, right? And so, but we still think of them as space, even though you could think of Y as P if, if you wanted to. But crucially, there's an SUN symmetry that's gauged, and the Gauss law is this one underneath. So let me just quickly just explain what this is. So X, uh, this is commutator of X, X and Y is K, right? So this is the, um, the SUN charge. And what Polyquinacos did was add these psi fields. And so these psi's are, are uh, vectors, um, n by n vectors. And the, the, let me, the, the, the reason they're here is the following. Suppose these were not here, then x and y equals k is the Heisenberg algebra. And this does not have finite dimensional representations, which is just a fancy way of saying that if you build a dagger x plus i y, then you can just keep going. You can keep applying a dagger, and you just keep going up, right? In a harmonic oscillator, there's no limit to how high you can raise a harmonic oscillator. Okay, that's so. There's no finite dimensional representation because you can just keep going up, right? Well, this this psi is a projection, and it means you keep raising, but at some point you hit zero, right? And so the raising operators truncate at some points, and that's what this psi field buys for you. Okay, it's, it's a, it, it, trunk, it just makes the algebra have a finite dimensional representation. Um, they, they don't really do anything. They're, they're basically pretty inert background fields, but they, they're like a background charge and they, they're gonna set the size of the droplets, but, but that's all they're gonna do. So they're not gonna play a very big role. Okay, so this is, this is the Hamiltonian, all right? Um, the fun is sort of in the Gauss law, right? Otherwise this would be very, very simple. Uh, and so the, um, oh, sorry. Uh, the, um, the ground state was written down by your very own uh, Van Ramstonk. 
and Hellerman. Uh, also, so 01 was a, a busy year for this uh, for this theory. Um, and this is this is it. Okay, this, this is the ground state. And so you build it. You write. It's just want to reduce the, the z, which is x plus i y, um, and 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 z dagger. Okay. Now it turns out that it's very very to make this state. I mean, the state may or may not be transparent to you, depending how you, it's actually, it is. It, it is possible to think about this state quite quite reasonably, but I think it's even more transparent uh, in a certain terms of in certain variables. So we're going to write down a wave function in a in a certain basis. And so um, x and y are, con are con canonically conjugate, right? So the wave function is just a wave function of the x matrix, yeah. And so we can diagonalize x now. But a better way to say it is we can parameterize it like this. There's no assumption here, right? I'm just writing it any matrix, any Hermitian matrix, and we've written as u x u dagger, right? And so there's x u, and I'm going to rotate these psi fields at the same time. If I do that, the I think the pen should be charged now. So if I do that, the, the matrix is going to factorize in oops into into three bits, which is quite convenient, and this is the s u n bits. This debt u is a phase, um, and so if I rotate u by a by a by a, I, I do a un, this picks up an i k phase, which was this this i k this k in the Gauss law. Okay, so the sort of the charge of the state has all been factored off into this prefactor. Then the, the eigenvalues of x have this form, which is very, very similar to, um, this looks like a van der Mond, kind of very similar to the, to the single matrix model. And this k here reminds us of sort of laughlin s kind of states, but it's a one-dimensional wave function. So this is actually the wave from the ground state of the Calagero model for people who care about such things. And then the, 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 the vector bit is also factored. Okay, so now, uh, we're going right. So this wave function factorizes and it allows the computation of two different contributions to the entanglement. These psi fields don't do anything. They're factorized. That, that, that there's no entanglement from them. So we're going to do what Dazidel told us to do. We're going to factorize the eigenvalues of x. Okay. And x, the eigenvalues of x have a wave function very similar to the single matrix wave function. So that's going to give us an entanglement very similar to what, what was there in the single matrix model. So I'll, I'll tell you how we do that in a second. And we'll see that that's going to describe entanglement of the boundary mode of the droplet. So there's a gauge invariant boundary mode that goes around this incompressible droplet. Perhaps more interesting is um, there's also a contribution from the U's. So when we, when we partition the X's, there are going to be some unitaries that act within one set of eigenvalues, some that act on the other, but there's some that act between both of them. And those U's that mix the partition of the eigenvalues are also going to give you a contribution to the entanglement uh, that we're going to calculate. Okay, and you can think of these as non-local correlations in the wave function due to Gauss's law. So this is the most important slide. Okay, this is the picture of where we're now going to, there are going to be some equations uh, coming up, but this is the picture, right? So we're going to have these eigenvalues are going to form a droplet. Remember the x. Now these are eigenvalues of x, right? They're not eigenvalues of z, right? Z was x plus i y. These are eigenvalues of x, and that means they are delocalized in the y direction because remember y and x are canonically conjugate, right? So these gray lines are sort of collections of eigenvalues of, of the x matrix. We're going to see in a minute they form a a, a circle, um, and so I the cut. This is an emergent space, right? That there's this. this I've just started with the quantum mechanics that certainly didn't have a droplet in it, right? The ground state of the theory has this droplet in it. I'm going to define a partition of the matrix degrees of freedom that's going to correspond to this geometric cut through the droplet. And there are going to be two contributions to the entanglement. The eigenvalue contribution is going to correspond to entanglement in a sort of the boundary mode, right? It's, it's incompressible, but you can, there's like little waves that can go around the boundary. And the uh, there's going to be a gauge theoretic contribution that essentially counts the number of off-diagonal modes that go across this cut. And you have to have a measure. If you want to count something, you need to have the right measure for it. We're going to have the right measure, and we're going to count them. And we're going to see that it's going to go like this length. Okay, so it's going to be an emergent area law entanglement. And so the gauge theoretic entanglement knows about the length of the semicircle, right? So it knows about the emergent geometry. Okay, so let me let's do the eigenvalues first. I'll go a, li a little bit. I'm not going to have many details. 
uh, because this is similar to computations in single matrix models. Uh, but we did use a new method, which I, I think so I, I would like to maybe advertise. So um, a, well, I mentioned the collective field earlier. And so when you have, so we have a wave function for n eigenvalues, right? And I'm partitioning them. So it's very nice to introduce this collective field, which is this at x, which is a sum over the eigenvalues delta x minus xa. So if I integrate the collective field between two points, it counts the number of eigenvalues between those two points. So it's the density of eigenvalues, right? So integral nx dx from a to b is the number of eigenvalues in a to b, right? Just from this delta function. Right? So we can just write the wave function in these variables, right? And so we had psi of x, but this is, a, I can think of this as a change of coordinates. It's a bit subtle because I'm changing from n labels to a whole function, but you can it, it, you can still do it and you have to be a bit careful with the measure, but you can do it. And so I can think of the wave function of the eigenvalues as a wave function of this collective field. And remember the wave function, for example, had an e to the minus x a squared term, right? So that becomes this, right? Because n is this delta function. And so if I do the integral, it just picks up the sum of our eigenvalues. And similarly, the first term, that was this guy, this power, I put that up in the exponent as k times a log with two sums, and that becomes, that becomes this. And so this is it's a wave function. This is the wave function, right? It's not, it's not some action, right? So the wave function is e to the s. And this is a very well-known problem now, probably to several of you, that it's a bunch of, it's a density with logarithmic repulsion and a x squared trap. And so I could ask, where is this wave function supported, right? So where is mod psi squared maximized? And at large n, it's strongly maximized on a bigness semicircle. Okay. So all these eigen, so at large n, the this 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 n is very strongly supported on this semicircle. Okay, which is this is a bigness semicircle. Um yeah, that yeah, good. Okay, so so that that's where the eigenvalues are at, at large at large n. Um, of course, the density has to be positive, right? That's why you only get half of the circle. But, but it's very natural to think about it as a as a full circle. And now to see the entanglements, you can look at fluctuations about this semicircle. So the actual density of eigenvalues is the the semicircle plus some fluctuation. And you plug that into the wave function. Let me go back. So this term is actually linear. This term is quadratic. And so this whole thing is exactly equal to this quadratic term, right? which is now quadratic in the fluctuations. It's not exact because there's also a measure when you go from the eigenvalues to the collective field. But it turns out that leading order at large n, the, the only role of this measure is to insist that n has to be positive. That right, which is not that that the, the density can't be a negative function. Okay. So this thing, this is now just a Gaussian wave function for fluctuations about the circle, right? And uh, we know how to calculate uh, one one people know how to calculate the entanglement of Gaussian wave functions in, in space. You you know, grand grand the ha handle and you find that the entanglement is one sixth of log n L. So where L is this length across along this cut. And so this is sine theta. If theta is the angle, and you may know in a CFT, on a circle, the entanglement is log sine theta. And sine theta is, is this L, okay? Uh, and this one sixth is because it's chiral. It's not one third, it's one sixth. Um, and N is something that we get from this microscopic description. And it's because when you remember that this thing came from eigenvalues, it turns out that the mode expansion of this field, the angular momentum is truncated at n. Okay, and so and that leads to this cutoff here. There are non this so this is a sort of leading universal. There might be constants inside the log that I'm, I'm not keeping track of. All right, so and this is this is what you expect from Chern Simons from the boundary mode of a Chern Simons, the chiral boundary mode of a Chern Simons theory. I should say these guys is a very nice paper. They don't have this n, of course, because that you need a microscopic model. That's the whole point. This quantum hole, 
matrix model is a microscopic finite completion of, of quantum hole physics. Right? So it's a completely finite uh, entropy. Very good. Okay. So now let's get to the, I think, what was the, yeah, perfect. In the last 15 minutes, 20, 15 minutes, I'll, I'll tell you about the off-diagonal modes. So let's take a step back and think about uh, gauge theory and even, even simpler lattice gauge theory. Um, you know, just to not have complications with entanglement and field theories and so on. So the basic gauge invariant observables in a uh, lattice gauge theory are Wilson loops. And so those are not local, but nonetheless, you know, there is some locality in the theory, right? And if I'm living in one room and someone's living next door, we, we, I might ask how much can I know about the quantum states in the other room, only looking at the state, the quantum state in this room, right? So this, 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 this a geometric entanglement should still have some meaning, uh, but there's sort of an obstruction, which is that the gauge invariant observables are not local. Okay. And it basically comes down to what do we do with uh, links that go across the cut. So I'm going to give you two, two different, there, there's many, many works on this and they basically more or less converge, I, I think, and there are some choices to, to be made. Um, and so I'll give you two, two perspectives. I think that the simplest one, which I, I, um, there, there may be some pre, there is some prehistory to this idea, but this is a clear, a clear paper um, that, that basically proposes that, okay, so you've got your lattice, the, the U's live on the links of the lattice, and let's say your cut goes through the links. Okay, and that, that's the cut we're going to consider. Then the proposal is that you should duplicate, you should embed your state into a bigger Hilbert space. So your, your original physical Hilbert space doesn't factorize. We're going to embed it into a bigger Hilbert space that does factorize and calculate the entanglement in that. Okay. Um, and so you, the idea is that you, um, you duplicate the, 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 the gauge field on, on the link. Um, but everything had better be gauge invariant at the end of the day. And so you do have to impose Gauss's law in the bigger states. And in simple situations, which we'll see some in a minute, that requires that these two copies that you introduce have to be maximally entangled. Okay. Um, and that's sort of forced on you. It's not a choice. Okay. So, so, because otherwise it can seem that there's like, well, you could do all kinds of things and it's not, it's not quite, it's not true. You, you sort of double this, but then you're, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll see this, how this works in our case in a second. So what that means is that for every link you cut, you get an extra entanglement, um, which is basically the dimension, the dimension of the, of, of the Hilbert space on each link, because on each, all the possibilities in that link are maximally entangled. And so this gives you a new area law because it counts the number of links you cut, and but it, and and the, it's the dimension of the on-site Hilbert on on link Hilbert space that comes. And so here again is a situation where entanglement also becomes a counting problem, right? like it, very analogous to to the sort of the thermal entropy, infinite temperature thermal entropy. Very good. Now another way, if that if that wasn't completely compelling, another way here's another way to think about it. And so um, we're going to see that these U degrees of freedom, which were pure gauge in the full theory, uh, sort of acquire dynamics when you partition the theory. And a way of thinking about this that we found quite useful was this, this later paper by Donnelly and, and Frieda. And let's, I found it useful that let's think about what we would do in Chern Simons first. So let, uh, uh, let's go to a, I just see things are easier in this, the A0 equals zero gauge. And then the Lagrangian of Chern Simons theory is something like this. So these are the spatial components of the Maxwell field. There's some epsilon. Okay. And clearly we can write this integral over all the spaces, the integral of one plus the integral of the other, right? So I just split this up into two, into two regions. And now we imagine that, well, I'm the observer in this room. And so this, this, this is what I have access to. And so why don't I just try to quantize that theory? So if I do that, as, as I think you probably well know, uh, if I do a, a if I consider a pure gauge mode that doesn't vanish on the boundary, then its action doesn't vanish because in Chern Simons theory, you need to integrate by parts to show gauge invariance. And so this term does contribute to the action uh, this, by this, this boundary, this boundary guy. And this is sort of an avatar. It's not quite a chiral field yet, but it's, it's on its way to being a chiral, a chiral boundary mode. But what you will get from here is a phase space 
Okay, so so this this tells you that a dx of phi is the momentum conjugate, right, to to phi, right? And so now those will have canonical commutators, and you have a so on this. If I quantize this restricted theory, I'm going to get a non-trivial phase space uh, for some boundary modes. Similarly, the someone living in the other room will also get a phase space um, for these for these boundary modes, and again, it's going to turn out that um, the Gauss law is going to require these boundary modes to be maximally entangled. But the main thing is that they get, they get some, but what, right. And so you want, but what this does, what this construction does for you is that because it lets you calculate the momentum conjugates to, to this pure gauge mode. So in the full theory, gauge modes don't have conjugate momentum. Their conjugate momentum are zero, right? That's, that's what Gauss's law in a sort of Hamiltonian version of Gauss's law tells you that, that the, momentum conjugate to pure gauge modes just vanishes. There is no phase space of pure gauge modes. But when you have these boundaries, this splitting of the Lagrangian lets you calculate what the phase space is that you get from introducing this defect. And the dimension of that phase space is going to be the gauge theoretic entanglement. It counts how many boundary modes there are, but basically. Um, and, and look, why, why is it why you have a pure gauge thing? almost the only thing you can build, like the volume of that is the most integrating over the gauge group of boundary modes is the natural way to construct something gauge invariant. And so the volume of this gauge group of boundary modes, yeah, is the natural, is the natural entanglement. Okay. So inspired by this, we're gonna do a similar thing in this matrix case. So our Lagrangian, there is, I didn't write down, I wrote down the Hamiltonian before, but because X and Y are conjugate, it comes from a first order Lagrangian, right? Where there's a sort of an X, Y dot term, which we can write as uh, Z dagger Z, where Z remember was X plus I, Y. And, now, and as many of you also probably know from non commutative geometry, integrals are like traces and the traces are like the integrals. So that the analogous thing is splitting up this um, integral into two regions is splitting up the trace. And so let me introduce a theta, which I'll define in a minute, but it's some projection and, and a one minus theta. So this is an identity, okay? I've got theta plus one minus theta, that's just one. Right? I've taken Lagrangian and just the way we wrote it as a sum of two volume terms, I'm gonna write as a trace. I've got a trace over the over a linear basis and I write as a sum of two smaller traces, okay? So that's, we're gonna call that left and the right. But now similarly to before, how gauge transformations restricted to one side up acquired a Hilbert's phase space, the same thing's gonna happen here. So we, we, I'm gonna take, I'll define theta in a second. I'm gonna do a U transformation, a U, a pure gauge, a SUN rotation. And we'll see that some of the SUN modes acquire non-trivial kinetic terms. Okay? So, so firstly, what's theta gonna be? It's gonna be one, zero, zero, zero where one are the, are the lowest M eigenvalues of X. Right? I diagonalized X. Let me, let me keep the lowest M eigenvalues. So this is the full matrix is N by N. I take the lowest, I, I can order. I, I, I'm going to, I will, I order the eigenvalues and then I project, I write M to be the lowest projection. So this theta depends on X. Okay, it's so X dependent theta. Right? Pick a basis defined by the eigen, the state of the eigenvalues. This is a rather complicated beast, right? But at uh, a large n, where the eigenvalues are very strongly supported on on this on a certain distribution, it's something you can work with. So if you do that, you find so then I'm, you just take this and you just evaluate this this object, and this is what you find. Uh, so you find so x l are the left eigenval the eigenvalues of x. These are the diagonal entries of y, which are conjugate to the I say that they're meant to conjugate to the eigenvalues. But then there's an extra term, which involves the trace of the off-diagonal entries of y, right? Which makes sense, right? Because we diagonalized x, we didn't diagonalize y. If we add these terms together, they're a total derivative. Okay, so in the full theory, these are indeed pure gauge modes. They don't they, they don't do anything. But if we just restrict to one half, analogous to restricting to half of the Chern-Simons you do get this term and it suggests these are kind of conjugate to each other, right? Now what we do is, um, okay, the nice thing about this model is that it's very determined by Gauss's law, right? There's almost no dynamics in the bulk 
And so in a, in a dynamical model, these Ys might be quite complicated things, but here they're determined up to a gauge transformation by Gauss's law. And so these, these Y, these off the, the full Y, in fact, okay, so if we write Y as U, Y classical, uh, I don't know why we call it classical, to be honest, uh, U dagger, where this is the same U that you use to diagonalize X, right? Then Y, Gauss's law forces Y to have this form, okay? Um, so it's determined by the eigenvalues of X and by this sort of, this vector. And, and so this is fixed, these are really fixed. And so all the Y, the only degrees of the, the, these, what we should think of these Ys as being are really just these unitaries that act on both sides. And th those, are the, these, those are the degrees of freedom we're trying, those are like the phi's in the, they're like these guys in the chern simons case that we're trying to find a kinetic, the phase space for. Um, I'm just gonna mention this and come back to it later. That, so we're elevating some of the pure gauge mode to have some dynamics, but there's a choice and we don't elevate all of them. We only elevate the ones that respect the block structure. So that we're only considering unitaries that have, that have this form, okay? And I can try to justify that better to you later if you don't like it, but that's what we do. Okay, then what do you do? We have this Y, we have this thing, we plug it into this action. Um, okay, so let me, I'll try to make a, a longish story short, but the, um, so these U's, right? Are the, the, the U's are the pure gauge modes, right? And the U's that appear, okay, let, let's, I'm sorry. Let's take it back, step back to Chern Simons. You do a pure gauge transformation, right? But the, the, the only bits of the gauge transformation that acquire a phase space are the bits that live on the boundary, right? Most of the phi don't become dynamical. It's only the boundary values of phi that become dynamical. Similarly, most of these U's are not gonna become dynamical. It's only the U's that sort of intersect the boundary, okay? And the way we find these is to plug that form so we can parameterize y like this. We do a singular value decomposition. The nice thing about this is the the sing it's like it's like diagonalizing. I mean, y is not a, it's not a square matrix, right? So it doesn't have eigenvalues. These, these are sort of the closest. These are like the non-square matrix version of eigenvalues. The singular values are in, don't depend on the ro gauge rotations, right? They, 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 they're like the eigenvalues. These guys, these vectors have the gauge rotations in them, that, so they're the U's basically. And they're constrained to be orthogonal. These are like the different rows of U are orthogonal matrices, orthogonal vectors, okay? You plug this in and you find out that the action becomes psi, psi dot basically, the, the Lagrangian. And so psi dagger is conjugate to psi. And so they obey this commutation relation. And the singular value determines the commutator. Okay. And the beautiful thing is that about this classical saddle, there's basically almost all the singular values are zero, except for one. There are some subtleties of this statement in the sense that it's not quite true. Um, well, the statement is that all, all, the, all the singular values are exponentially small, except one. Okay. But, but uh, it's, it's as though there's only one singular value. And what that, what that is telling you is that most of these unitaries don't act on, don't cut the, through the boundary. Only some of them do, okay? And, and, and that's a really a huge simplification. And so in the interest of time, just, just believe me, that you only have to focus on one of these matrices. It's like one row. It means that of this unitary matrix, it's only in some basis, it's only one row of that unitary matrix that really acts on the boundary. And what do we have? So these size, the, the, like the use, are harmonic oscillators. They have a raising and lowering algebra. And there's a constraint that they have that they're normalized. And so as a count, how many of those are there? It's a counting problem, right? How many ways can you obey this normal? Right. So you have a psi, right? So psi squared, psi dagger psi has to equal one. And psi raises and lowers you in units of one of a lambda squared. Or I could rescale by lambda and put a lambda squared here. And then this would, then lambda is some big integer, 
how many ways can I make that in, how many ways can I distribute the quanta to make up that integer? So it's the, it's the same Hardy Ramanujan counting problem that comes up. This singular value turns out to be determined by the density of eigenvalues at this point. Perhaps not surprising because look, this matrix had a one over X minus Y in it. And so it ends up being dominated by X's and Y's that are close together. And so that's why the density at that point ends up, ends up appearing, okay? And so we calculated the singular value of this matrix, and then we have a counting problem, which we can solve with the Hardy Ramanujan. One more subtlety that I, I won't have time to go into, to use Hardy Ramanujan, it's important that these oscillators are identical. Right? So I've got, I've got a single N vector of oscillators, and I have to, and there's this counting problem, but the different entries of that matrix have to be identical and that inherits that that is it is true, and it comes from the fact uh, that we want to keep the eigenvalues ordered, and so we shouldn't consider gauge transformations that reorder the eigenvalues, and and that sort of enforces this um, identicalness. Um, one more, I'm, I'm just going to put these words out there. You're going to have to look at the paper to really. Uh, so the, the last fact is. So I know what the boundary modes are. Why are they maximally entangled? So Gauss's law, right. So I have these, these, a vector of oscillators on one side, and I have a vector of oscillators on the other, on the other side, right? Because each side has this. How do I, the only way I can build something gauge invariant out of a vector is to dot it with another vector. And so the natural, the state that, that obeys, the, so this is, these are the oscillators on one side, these are the oscillators on the other side. And this is the state that's gauge invariant. And if you expand that out, you find out that it's a maximally entangled state in this oscillator space. Okay. Um, um, right, so we solve the counting problem. And because this density is in there and the density is, is the length, right? It's, it's just this length of the semicircle, right? The, the, the density forms a semicircle. And so you find out that the entanglement entropy is some finite number. This one sixth is always always wants to show up when you're doing Hardy Ramanujan ology. Um, there's some finite number that depends on n and k. Let's forget about this log for a minute. And this L is the area law. Okay, so there's an emergent area law from from counting the number of unitary matrices that act on this region. Good. This log, it turns out. Actually, I don't totally understand it, but I know that it is is related to the fact that this cut is intersecting the boundary. And I know that because we also did a circular cut that doesn't intersect the boundary and you get the area law, but without a log. And in fact, uh, I convinced myself, and I think it's a true argument that it, it, for any, any, any shape inside that doesn't, that doesn't cut the boundary, uh, you get this area law. A nice thing about this circular case is we can also get the subleading term, which I don't have a good interpretation of right now, but it, 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 it's there. Okay, let me let me try to finish on time. So, sorry for running there, rushing there a bit at the end. So we defined a partition in a simple two matrix model. Remember the name of the game is we like to, I would like to get a grip on matrix wave functions, right? And in particular, how you partition them. And there were some, there are some subtleties with partitioning them. A simple two matrix model and we computed the corresponding entropy and there were two contributions which each of which matched the expectations from emergent locality there was a logarithmic contribution from the eigenvalues of one of the matrices that matches the entanglement of a chiral boundary mode and there's an area law gauge theoretic entanglement that matches what you'd expect from a bulk churn simons field it's an area just in the sense that it's an area law so now that we understand that, what we'd like to do is move on uh, to more complicated models that do have compressible bulk dynamics or sort of second order kinetic terms. Um, and there are models with two or three matrices that, 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 that do that and that, that's what we're thinking about. But I, I believe that the sort of kinematic structure will be similar uh, to, to what we've done here. All right, th thanks for listening. Thank you, Sean, for the very nice talk. Do we have any questions for him? Maybe I'll 
Yeah, cool. Oh, is there a, okay, I hear, I hear a reverb, but maybe that's not, not everyone fine. hearing that. Okay. Um, yeah, one, one question, um, just a kind of general question. I'm wondering how, um, how do, you, do you think this eigenvalue space in this model, uh, I mean, should I think of that as a baby version of a bulk in a DSCFT or is it something else? Yeah, yeah, yes, I think so. I mean, I, um, in a in a in a sufficiently general sense, definitely. I mean, yeah. yes, it, it's what there is, right? Uh, there, 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 there's, it's just a uh, you lose a dimension because because it's sort of topological. But but um, um, yes, I think I think morally yes. And and um, what's going to be the main complication, even with low dimensions, once you start having dynamical you know second order kinetic terms uh, more 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 like bfss type models is that um the eigenvalues are going to be dynamical but these off diagonal modes are also going to have non-gauge dynamics in them as well right you can just excite oscillators there right and that and that becomes a bit more confusing what, what you're meant to do with that the, so there's a so what was nice about this model is that there was a the dynamical modes were only the eigenvalues, and so they were easy to split. And then there are these pure gauge modes that gave a nice, included an off-diagonal contribution, but they were pure gauge, so it was possible to get a handle on them. The next step in complexity is that uh, there are non-pure gauge modes that are also off-diagonal and that presumably relate to the bulk some, somehow as, as well. And so life will be more complicated, I, I, I think. Um, um, so all that to say that I think, yes, yes, it's like the bulk, but it's a very simplified bulk. And maybe that, I guess, a more technical question uh, that relates somehow, you briefly referred to these sort of general shaped curves ah, on, yes, on your disk. Yes, yes. And, and so is it, it's possible then to specify some arbitrary shape think... and, and uh, do a calculation of an entropy associated with that? Yes, and I think so. It's right at the end of the paper in a section, and I, I think it, it's it's okay. Yeah, wonderful. So, so actually, Alex and I had a big fight about whether the paper should emphasize the circular cut or the vertical cut, and and he was in favor of the circular cut. But let, let but <laughs> I'll tell you what. So what's but what's nice about the vertical cut is that we really know the wave the wave function is very very explicit in in those variables like we when you diagonalize x you really have the wave function very very explicitly and you don't have to take any large k limits or any it's just you really know the full quantum wave function however this model has two parameters it has an n and a k all right in the large k limits in addition to large n limit we take large n first and then large k um, the matrices themselves sort of become classical, and things become so easier. And 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 this and it, this is the limit where I can also describe all these other cuts. And so, for example, the circular. Let me tell you how the circular one works because it's really really simple. So um, so the the, the the Z matrix has a, it just becomes that there's a if you take this this Lagrangian and you just minimize it classically, you find a matrix. And, and this, this matrix is an upper diagonal. Okay, I can't actually remember what the entries are, but, but it, it's not the diagonals, it's all zero, including the diagonal. And then there's this upper diagonal that's non zero, which makes sense because these Zs are the raising operators. And so if you build, and then, you, and then the, the, the radial partition literally corresponds to just blocking this matrix like, like that. Mm -hmm. And this, this uh, singular value is literally this little one here. The, the, the one the one off diagonal element that's in the, that makes it into this cut right this is something like square root of m i think or something like something like that yeah exactly because the, the uh anyway it's, it's a known thing and this this square root of m is basically this this the length of this circle um mm -hmm. essentially straight straight away okay so it, it's it's very clear there's a now to get the general to um so yeah so that's quite nice but it if you want to do the subleading corrections to that, it, it's harder. Whilst in this in this vertical cut, you really have the whole wave function, and mm -hmm. so so that it's okay. But but the more general ones, yeah. So let's see how did we had the argument. Let me see how does it go. Uh, give me let me see if I can. 
Oh boy. Uh, yeah, it's a nice argument that involved a non-commutative delta function. And 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 let me let me see. So yeah, it goes something like this. So you, you build, you have exactly. So you have some function f of x and y. And when that equals zero, that would define some classical uh, surface, right? So for example, x squared plus y squared would, would be the that one. Um, you build uh, okay, it's something, yes, exactly. Then you build theta. <laughs> um, long time for this to run out. Let's see what I do with my, my fingers, maybe. So then you build, no, I can't. Give me one second to recharge this thing. You build the matrix theta of x, mm -hmm. theta, theta of f, which projects you onto the lowest m eigenvalues of, of this f matrix. Mm -hmm. Then the off, these off diagonal blocks of Z are Z commutator that theta. That makes sense. So, so um, this, that will get me far. So you, you have theta sub F, which the lowest eigenvalues of F, and you, you construct Z commutator theta. Mm -hmm. And that's the analogous of these off diagonal guys, it turns mm -hmm. out. But this is a delta function because this is a because z is like a derivative, a non commutative derivative. Theta is a step function, and so this is like a delta function that's supported on this length, on, on that's supported on the on on this boundary, and and um, okay, then you're almost there. That, that, so 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 that that, that 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 that's roughly how it, how it goes. So that, that that you can you can naturally associate these off diagonal blocks. In, in, a, in, a, in a general, in a basis, exactly. You take your area, you take your region, that defines a basis. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then the off diagonal block of the Z matrix in that basis is naturally associated with a non commutative delta function. And that, that I, I can't remember what the next step is, but, but that, that somehow mm -hmm. turns into this area very, very naturally. Um, that, that, yeah, that, so that, that, that's okay. quite nice, I think. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll have a look at that. Yeah, yeah, great, Thank, thanks so much. Good. Do we have any other questions? Well, can I ask a question again? Uh, so perhaps a model that is in between is, uh, you know, this Tong Turner model? Or the which one, sorry? The Tong, Tong David Tong and uh, Turner model. Oh, it's the but same one, no? I think it is this well, one. Well, this size can have an F flavors, right? Oh, 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 oh yeah, 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 no, absolutely. And then yes, they can yes, be yes. dynamical also. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's right. So that's right. That, indeed, that is. So there's a there's a version of these models that correspond to non-abelian quantum Hall states, um, right. and 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 that that's a very natural. Uh, Somehow this is in between. Uh, yes. No. I think that would be a that would be an extremely natural model to to uh, to think about. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. That, that's right. Yeah. I, I, another question: Can you express these partitions in terms of representations of UN or UM? And see this as a representation theoretic uh, entanglement yeah, from dimension know, of. That's a very that's an excellent excellent uh, question. Um, you know we've done this sort of slightly low tech thing in, in a way, um, and there, there may be a more group theoretic uh, nice. I, I wouldn't be surprised um, if there's a nicer way a nicer way to do it. Uh, uh, yeah, and and especially I tell you what this is this is related to the following question that we did not get um, that there there is this topological term there's a, there's a subleading log k k log two of, uh, minus a half log k in in Chern Simon's theory there's a topological term now which we did not get but we didn't get it because our calculation doesn't have the resolution to get there's several I showed you one log correction but there's several other log corrections that that. We didn't uh, work hard enough to get. I'm not 100% sure. I, I've kept changing my mind whether they should be there or not because our UV completion is not local. So I, it's not obvious that these topological terms should be there, but they might be. And a more systematic, if you could, if, if, if one could set up a, a way of doing a calculation that was, wasn't was built on some sort of semi-classical expansion, 
uh, that would be a much nicer way to try to get that. Um, so so I, I totally, I, I, yeah, I suspect there's a better way to do it. Maybe, I'm not sure if this is a version of the previous question, but I was wondering if in, from this point of view of identify, of assigning entropies to sub-algebras of observables in, in quantum systems, um, is, is, is there a way to understand the thing you calculated as being associated to some particular sub-algebra? Yeah, right, Mark. In fact, I think we talked about this briefly many years ago. And Maybe. Uh, I visited UBC. Uh, just, uh, you know, uh, um, yeah, that sounds very reasonable, right? So, uh, yeah. So, so one would, uh, I think in this model, one would have a hope of really do it. it, it let me put this way. If it's possible, which it has every right to be possible, yeah. uh, this might be a very good model for actually doing it in. Yeah, it seems like one should maybe yes. be able to understand yes. what are the sub algebras. And... Yes, I, mean, I it could I, be I, there are a lot. But... Um, you know, I, I, it, it connects more than, I don't, I'm not sure quite connect, panels was asking maybe something a little bit different, but, yeah. but uh, this thing I was talking about right at the end, I think connects to that, right? So, so mm. because these, 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 um, okay, I, I don't know. Yeah, so somehow it connects a bit to this, I think, right? So you have this function that defines a curve and then you could sort of build a delta function supported on that curve. And, and I guess you want the yeah, whole it, region. It seems like it's related to this target space entanglement story. And, and there, I think you can understand things in terms of subalgebras. or uh, okay, I'm not exactly sure, but some, some projection operators, uh, um, would help. Let's see. Well, let me say something yeah. else that, that um, no, actually, no, let me not. Well, um, no, no, let me not. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I mean, you know, this, for example, this, uh, I think it is related actually, the, these these vectors that Polyquinacos introduced, mm -hmm. they're, they're sort of inherent. I mean, you could imagine starting with the full plane a la, a la Susskind, and then these, these and then these 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 vectors are somehow restricting you to the subalgebra that's now corresponding to this to the disk, right? And and so you might imagine that what you have to do is come up with appropriate projectors that reduce that reduce your algebra to the algebra of some of some region, right? And and they might be something like the singular vectors of um because because there's only one of this F matrix or so so, so the, 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 this thing I was just talking about before it, it might be that you can take a curve. That, that actually, I think it might be something like you have to take the curve, get this delta function by commuting with this Z operator. And then the singular vectors of that delta function might be like the size or something. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if those are the words in the right order, but I think they might be the right words, um, if, that may, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. The, 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 because the, the size that appear, sorry, my pens went out again. The size that appear here are very similar to the singular vectors because this is Gauss's law, exactly, right? So, right? so exactly, you should put them on the other side and they're like charges. You, you can think of these sides carrying charge. Where did this charge come from? Well, it could come from strings that are sort of going across your boundary, right? And, and, and so, and that's what these, these, yeah, these, uh, these singular vectors uh, here were sort of carrying charge that was not this outside your region. Um, and, and, and yeah, so I think these things should somehow come together to do what you want. But the, I mean, the doubling associated with the cuts seems to suggest it's not really a subalgebra. It's it's kind of maybe it's a subalgebra of the sort of doubled system. But uh, um, may, okay, so but, but what I um, let's see, Michelle, what, what I meant was okay. I, I, this is all um, um, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not, <laughs> these are just speculations, but but. Um, I'm saying this equation, the set of functions that you can build out of X and Y that obey those commutators end up becoming the functions on the disk, not on the plane. And if you didn't have those side vectors, it would be the space of functions on the plane. And so these size are somehow restricting the, the, the space of functions you can build. 
And so I think picking different sides would would might would map you onto different regions. Um, is, is I, I think I think what what the different way you have this infinite dimensional algebra, and you want to truncate it, right? And I think this these these uh, psi well, yes uh, psi psi vectors uh, might do that. Mm -hmm. So you also have this formula, this size essentially fit the non-singlet sector, right? If you reduce oh. the, your problem to one dimension, to the eigenvalues of x, in some sense, you have these terms psi dagger psi over xa minus xb, right? Yes, uh, yes, that's right, also here. Right, so this is some kind of piece in the Hamiltonian that is similar to the non-singlet sector, right? Yes, that, that's absolutely, yes, that's So, cool. so in that's some cool sense, right. these are all feeding the, the UN representation. That's absolutely yeah, yeah exactly. From that might connect with what you said. That that's right. Yes, right. That, that's right. That, that's right. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna have to go now. Actually, um, guys, it was really a fun fun chat. Um, Good. You thanks a lot. Uh, thank you. Let's thank you one more time. Yes. Thanks, much. Thanks, Felipe. Nice to see you all. Hope to see you in person soon, somewhere, somehow. <laughs> bye. Yeah, bye. Bye.